Hello everyone. Welcome back to Science Talk Show. Today you have joined with us for at another episode of Science Talk Show. This is presented by Times of Biotech and today we have a very special guest Dr. Laura Harris. She's from Michigan University. Let's hear from her about her inspiring journey and the research which she is carrying on. Thank you for the introduction. I'm excited to be here today to share with you my journey to success, a bioinformatics story. Um, once again, my name is Laura Harris. I'm the director of training at Michigan State University for ICER, which stands for the Institute for Cyber Enabled Research. And if you have any questions, you can reach me at my email. So a little bit about me. Uh, as I just said, I'm the director of training at Michigan State University, AKA MSU. Um, I've been there since February and I'm really happy to be at my alma mater, which I'll talk about in a second. I'm also the founder and principal investigator of the Harris Interdisciplinary Research Group. I started that group in 2015 and am currently working with around 40 or so volunteer researchers and I'll talk about that in a minute too. I also work with the American Society for Microbiology uh, as their former branch president in the state of Michigan in the United States, uh, but more broadly as a representative on their Council of Microbial Sciences, uh, which is an advisory board for the board of the society. So let's talk about how I got here. So I thought it would be handy to have a timeline because I've been at this a while. I actually started uh, back just before 2000, you know, so a whole you know, prior century ago, and I got my bachelor's of science in microbiology. I then went and did a master's program and that started with an experimental component where I was working at the wet bench. Then there was some changes within my degree program and my committee decided to take me from the wet bench into bioinformatics, the computer sciences. So my master's in science and microbiology was actually a split degree. I had some wet bench and I had some in silico or what we'll call dry bench. I then went to work in industry for several years and working starting at the lab um, there I was Bioport, which I'll talk about in a minute, working on the anthrax vaccine development. I then went to work for Pfizer, um, but this was before the COVID vaccine. We were doing uh, dermatology compounds. And then after that, I decided to go get a PhD. Uh, that didn't quite go as planned, which I'll talk about more in a minute. So I ended up with a master's degree. And this is entirely experimental. We were actually working with mice. So I've worked with Petri dish, I've now worked with animals. I then did some clinical writing for the Food and Drug Administration or the FDA. And then I decided to go into teaching. So I did teaching for a while and then I decided to join bioinformatics and now I primarily do bioinformatics. So let's go into a little more detail. Where did I start? Well, I started in the late nineties as a Michigan State University student. And my goal was to attend medical school. So I wanted to do that and get experience. So I interned at a local hospital. And then I was at MSU and I met Dr. Julius Jackson as one of my professors in class. He was interested in both computation and experimentation. And he was one of the few faculty at the time that looked at both. So that intrigued me and he was part of this new uh, BSMS program that was a combined program. So I had him as my mentor for this program. Hence the confusion where we started with experimental but then switched to computational. Fortunately, I had a proper mentor for that. So then I went to work. As I said, I worked on the anthrax vaccine. We worked on uh, hair growth and acne drugs and all sorts of things. And so at that point, I really enjoyed working in science and I really liked Pfizer in particular. So I went back to school with the idea that I wanted to get a PhD and I wanted to become a study director. I wanted to lead the experiments that were going on. And so I went to get my PhD in cell and molecular biology. 
Then I had my first kid and kids literally change everything. I have this quote over here from Elon Musk that once you have a family, you start taking risks, not just for yourself, but for your family. And so it becomes much harder for things to work out. And I include this picture particularly because my husband took this. This is how he said he found me most days. I would be so tired from my PhD program working in the lab and doing classes that I would just come home and pass out with the baby. And that's what it was for the night until I woke up the next day and had to do it all over again. And it wasn't a great time. So at that point, I decided, all right, maybe this isn't for me. So I dropped with a master's and then I moved on to teaching. So I started as an online adjunct teacher for University of Phoenix. But then I started to, you know, one class here, one class there, kids getting a little older. Okay, I'll take on new work at a different university. Then I start teaching adjunct in person, part-time class here, one night there, et cetera, still being able to fit in the kid. And so at that point then I became promoted to their lead faculty area chair for the state of Michigan. And this was in health and in science. And eventually when I came to Davenport as a part-time instructor, they liked me so much they hired me in full-time. And that became an interesting thing because I wasn't sure I was ready for that, but a lot of friends encouraged me to go back. So at Davenport, I had the responsibility of being a full-time teacher. I taught usually five classes in the fall and five classes in the spring and sometimes in the summer too. I also had to prepare the laboratory classes. So the basic biology classes, the uh, anatomy physiology classes, micro classes, those kind of things. But these are lab-based classes. I am a go-getter. So for promotions, I had to get a terminal degree, which means I got to get that PhD that I left behind me. And I have to have professional responsibility. I have to be on committees. I have to be part of the ASM, the American Society for Microbiology. I, I have to publish, I have to do things. Well, most instructors that I worked with at Davenport got their PhD or an ED in education. They weren't researchers. And that's because Davenport was a teaching college, not a research college. Michigan State University is a big 10 research college. But remember, I wanted to become a study director. So then I started actually becoming a study director. I started the Harris Interdisciplinary Research and I had no money. So we decided to go back to bioinformatics because we had a computer and a computer was free at our desk. So we started programming a little bit here, cut and pasting there, thinking about these things. And I would tell my students, and my students would be like, wow, I can do this by just cutting and pasting. I don't need to necessarily know how to program and I can do it in Excel and that's free and okay. And so then I got students together that were excited to do this with me. And you see some of them presenting posters and goofing off and just having a grand old time. Well, then one thing led to another and we started to get awards for those posters. And we were asked to give talks and we were asked to be commencement speakers and we were asked to go to national conferences. And the next thing I know, I'm standing next to a Nobel prize winning chemist. And that was a really cool ride. So by the time I actually got my PhD in biomedical informatics from Rutgers and that PhD was done entirely online remotely and was done in a research field, not in education. I already had several honors within American Society for Microbiology. I had several community honors. And of course, Davenport loved me. I was getting money from them. We were having awards, all sorts of stuff. My students succeeded from my success. So they had countless posters. We had national presentations, um, both talks and posters, and five papers published with me as senior author. It's unheard of to be a PhD student and publishing as a senior author because that's the most knowledgeable position. And then my students, you know, I've listed a couple of them, but I have more awards here that I could list. My point here is that I'm already a study director just by trying to be one. So then COVID happened. 
it seems like it's the pivotal point in all of our lives at this point. And the sad part was all my experimental friends lost the ability to do their research. They lost their bacteria strains. They lost their mice that were genetically modified because no one could get to them. No one could take care of them. It became a problem. We lost millions of dollars in that stuff. Set science back many years, but it didn't really affect me because I was working on a computer that was in my basement. And all I had to do was put my slippers on and go down there. And as long as I had electricity, we were good to go. So I was able to continue doing research and Amber Park, who just graduated and she's in medical school, go fig, you know, was winning all sorts of awards. She was a student keynote research address, you know, posters at the World Microbe Forum. It, it, she had a lot of fun just researching COVID with stuff we had already worked on prior. So now I'm at Michigan State University, an actual Big Ten research university. I get paid to do research for some of my time now. That's pretty cool for me. I also get paid to do some outreach like this talk today. Um, and then a lot of my time at MSU is spent on training. So, you know, developing and implementing courses, not only in bioinformatics, but also in general, things like Python programming, or how do I use a high performance computer? And that's been fun because I'm used to only having my laptop or my one little server in the basement. Now I've got a whole super computer farm at my disposal and I'm trying to learn how to use it because I wasn't always trained in that. So just to give you an idea of what I'm doing right now, um, for research, I still want to continue being a study director. I like what we've built. And we've expanded a bit, about 40 volunteer researchers right now come to our research group and actively participate every month. A good majority of those are public. 20 currently active research projects and just listed some of them like lung cancer, uh, oral squamomous cell carcinoma. My favorite is the effects on gravity across micro tissues because these are actually samples from mice from space International Space Station and on Earth. So that's been a fun side project. Public outreach, I've done about 11 talks since March. Um, and so I've talked to around 10,000 people and I've got four more of these like this one this month. So I'm excited to inspire use of computers in research. And of course, training. I've developed around eight online workshops. Most of them are from Michigan State University personnel only because we don't wanna give the supercomputer to everybody, but there are public workshops if people are available and quite a few of our trainees are public, um, looking at around 400 people so far for six months. So my future goal, what I really wanna do is grow an educational culture that focuses around research-based experiential learning through computer use. So what is that? Research-based experiential learning means you learn your concepts through hands-on application. And you're doing that to answer legitimate research questions. So not only are you learning valuable skills by doing, your outcome helps the rest of the world through answering research questions, okay? And so for that, I'll, I'll put my email back up in case you didn't catch it the first time. I know uh, Sobin has some questions, so let's go. Um, I think I called, I invited it because I thought that you are an inspiring researcher. But I would like to add one thing. Most of the people who, those who are doing PhD, they do specifically I'm talking about the girls, they don't go for kids, thinking that yes. they have a hurdle in their PhD. But you as a mother did a lot of this. In fact, you have achieved best of your life after being a mother. So I think this is a, even inspiring to those girls who are thinking that being a mother can be hurdle. Of course, it brings some difficulties, but I think if you are like a, if you want, if you know and you are determined that what you want, then you can go ahead and know nothing can stop you. 
ma'am if i talk about you i will talk a lot because you are actually <laughs> a inspiring person and after listening to this your story i think i'm i have become your fan but i think i have to go ahead with the questions so yeah, yeah. so i think being a bioinformatics i would like to ask one question today yeah. it is said that the data is a new fuel and you being a bioinformatics have to handle even though you are not trained but i think in that case it becomes even difficult to handle a data when you are not trained and you are trying to mm. combine and use so much of so much of data so ma'am how do you do and what tips are, we would like to give to our viewers as a and how they can manage that data so big data is pretty tricky to handle um, and particularly from coming from a biology background, you really need to temper your patients. I'm used to having sick people. So when you're dealing with sick people, there's an urgency to get things done and get things done right and quickly. But in computers, that becomes a disadvantage because the computer is going to work at its own pace, which can be slow if you're a crappy programmer. Um, and it can also malfunction, which then can be frustrating. So a lot of the, the life skills are what's going to really help with that interdisciplinary switch or transfer. Uh, beyond that, you just need to figure out what your research question is and try to figure out how you're going to answer it. And the literature can help you figure out some ways, um, but just be careful with the data how you interpret it can change your answer overall. So, you know, it's always good to get a second pair of eyes, even for me. That was a really good uh, like a response. And I think people will get benefited from that. Uh, Ma'am, I can see you are a few, a few of those persons who have both the experiences, wet lab experience, as well as uh, in silico experience. So I would like to take a chance to ask you which one you like the most and what is the difference while working? And um, most importantly, like uh, which one you like it? Okay. Um, well, the difference, we'll start there. So in the wet bench, the experimental side, you literally have to be at the lab. You have Petri dishes and mice and whatever that rely on you. And that's true of clinical studies as well. Uh, so there's an urgency in terms of you have to make sure you're available, you have to make sure you're on site, uh, things of that nature. And like when I worked at Pfizer, Pfizer had its own child daycare that the principal investigators that had kids could utilize. So there were options like that. Um, in the in silico side, you don't have any of that. There's no real urgency. Uh, there's no requirement to be anywhere. Um, and at that point, you can literally be in your basement. Uh, as to which I like most, I like them both. So I really couldn't pick. And I need them to rely on each other. So if you take me into the lab too much, I'll miss my computer. And if you put me in the computer too much, I miss my lab. And right now I am tending to be more to computer and I am missing my lab, but I know if I switch all the way over, I'll, I'll go the other way. So I'm really liking trying to find a hybrid between some time at the computer and some time at the, the bench. I hope ma'am, you will find an hybrid. Let's hope for the best. Another question I want to ask, ma'am, uh, as I know that you have appeared on the various uh, local news as an expert on COVID, and even you have published one paper when everyone was missing their lab, you could use the computer and you could publish one paper. I think uh, that is a molecular identification of molecular changes associated with SARS-CoV infection in the lungs. So can you share some details and experience working closely on COVID? Sure. Um, so there I actually have two stories. Um, and one of them you'll love because it involves my children. So um, when April of last year happened, uh, two things, well, three things occurred. One, I defended my dissertation three weeks into quarantine. That was fun. Two, I ended up with Amber Park, my uh, senior researcher at the time. Um, seeing what was going on and coming to me and saying, hey, Laura, 
is there something we can do? And at the time I was kind of stressed out about my dissertation. So I said, you know, if you can think of a way to do this, let me, let me know. And she said, yeah, I can find some data sets and we can, we can start moving on this. So I said, fine, let's do it. We actually had two papers that came from that. There's a second one um, that just came out last month in the uh, International Journal for Biometrics and Bioinformatics. Uh, but anyway, uh, and then the how I ended up on the news, <laughs> the kids story. So my two kids, of course, ended up in quarantine and I am stuck in quarantine. And of course, we all live together. And so they would frequently see me do podcasts or classes like this, and sometimes wouldn't participate in class. So they had the same question everyone did. When are we going to come out of quarantine? And I said to my oldest, well, you know, that's some basic math that we can do. Let's do it. And so her and I went through, okay, here's what a logistics curve is and how you can figure out slope at each point. And if your slope hits one because it's a straight line, that means you've hit point of inflection and now you're starting to do the other half of the curve and you can mirror that to predict the top. So we started screwing around with predictions and we ended up posting it on Facebook just out of curiosity. Now here's something we're dorking around with because we're bored at home. And one of her friends from school worked for the local news and saw that. So then he invited me to be on to share my predictions. So I did that. And then I turned out to be like within three days of when the government said we could start to come out of quarantine. So after that, anytime they wanted a prediction, they would call me up and say, hey, have you been working on this? If you have, would you please come and talk to the news? Um, it got to the point where I started saying, sorry, we just dropped the project because we've just been doing this so much. But that's how that all started. I think that was a fun. <laughs> Something you started with the fun became actually a real prediction. So that was a real fun, I must say. Another thing, let's move on from your story. I think I will talk a little bit about the student's benefit. I think sure. there are, yeah, there are a lot of students who wants to be a part of USA by doing a PhD or master's. In fact, a lot of people must be having a dream to study in and be a part of a Michigan University. So ma'am, I would like to ask you, like, what do you look into the students when they come up, when they write to, for the PhD to you or like your fellow uh, professors? Can you highlight some points? Sure. Um, my criteria may differ from other PhD advisors. So I always recommend people find mentors they're interested in working with and get to know their specific personality. For me personally, I'm one who's really big on intrinsic motivation. I want to know that someone is driven either from a base curiosity or from some sort of a need to serve the community. Whatever motivates them, I want to know that they are motivated. And to some extent, want to know why, because then you can kind of figure out what they're going to do and why they want to do it. Um, that can be a catch, though, because a lot of undergrads that I see, and even some of the graduate students, are more like, well, what do you want me to do next? And that's not really intrinsic motivation. That's more external motivation. I've got to tell you what to do or you don't do it. And that's not a good scientist because a good scientist is going to say, even if I don't get an answer, I'm going to find my own answer. And you might not know how to do it. You might completely be wrong at how you approach it. But that's part of learning. And that's all science is, is learning for the greater good of humanity and the earth as a planet. So I really look for that. And I do that more for like interviews. So if I have a thousand applications, for example, I'll look at the resume and the letter of recommendations and the personal statement. So does the person have research? Does the letter of recommendation indicate that their research was internally motivated, that they were curious, that you know they could do it on their own, seek their own answers? 
Um, and then when I talk to them, can they explain their research to me? Because if they can't explain it to me, that means they might not know it themselves, which means someone probably told them how to do it. They didn't figure it out or seek it out themselves. So these are all things that I'll look for in the process of trying to wean 1,000 people down to one. Okay, and I think that is a very good. Those students who are watching our interview session, they can actually come to those who are really enthusiastic about the research, I think they can reach to you. And even you have mentioned your email ID during the presentation. So I think it is a lot more easy. So ma'am, apart from that, what message would you like to give to your uh, new researchers, those who are working somewhere else, or some students who, are, who want, just want to start a PhD or, or some fellow researchers? Never give up. And I mean that both from personal experience and from a global perspective. The pandemic really has put everyone in a position of hardship. And we are experiencing less funding than we did before and research is being stalled. And it is just a frustrating time to be a scientist or a human in general. Um, and that's even harder when you're a research student because you don't necessarily understand how hard science can be and how many times failure occurs before you're successful. So you never really know when you're gonna reach that outcome and it's real easy to get close and then turn back. And that's the last thing you wanna do is quit when you can see a finish line or at least when a finish line is there, you might not be able to see it. One of the things that was powerful to me at Michigan State University, there was a recent graduate, a PhD graduate, who made a skirt that went around her waist, knee length, of all the rejected papers that she had had over the time she was a student. But you know what? She wore that to her defense because she had published one of the papers that she was defending. So the best thing I could say is never give up and always remember why you're doing it, that intrinsic motivation. Definitely, ma'am. I think this is, can be a best message because never give up. Most of, this is a sector where people get frustrated after so many repetition of the experiments and they think of give up. So I think this is the best message one can have. That was a lovely meeting to you, ma'am. And I think uh, I don't have any more questions. So we will wind up this show, but I'm really honored to know your story and the fun, some fun fact about you, the fun fact of actually predicting the COVID and when it will yeah. get uplifted. So I think that was a really fun, but obviously, a, experienced scientist, experienced researcher can only do that because it's not a something like can come out of the bloom. So I think that was your experience which came into in order and obviously they have picked a really good expert to predict and definitely that was the, their part. Apart from that, your research, my like computation biology, the way you are promoting it. And of course, this is something that you can have any time, even at the time of the COVID when everybody was really like frustrated, I'm not able to do, I'm losing my samples. And me as a person, I was in the same situation, but I did not thought about that. After that, I thought, and now obviously I'm also coming to the competition and now I know the importance, how important it is. So that's mm -hmm. the thing. So I'd really like to thank you for accepting the invitation and being on the show. It was our honor to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed being here. Thank you, ma'am.